I thought today I would, I would just reflect a little bit about the status of machine intelligence, where it's going, uh, AI, uh, and talk about some potential challenges that I see that uh, where folks like you can start doing some interesting, or continue doing interesting work and where it's so, why it's so relevant, uh, and then uh, sort of mechanisms like data and society and other uh, programs that might be useful in the future to address rough edges, costs, and concerns as they arise in terms of the influences of AI and people in society. Uh, we're clearly a, a, at an inflection point for AI. I, got my, I did my dissertation work in the 1980s where uh, if, you, if you showed me uh, you know, an iPhone back then I, I would, and told me about its power, I would be blown away. It, it, this, there's argument, arguably more power on an iPhone now then the supercomputers, you know, the ones with the blue cushions and the cooling tower in the early, early 90s. So it's really interesting where we are uh, with computation, memory. Um, the inflection point is also driven by the data in particular and the devices and sensors with the digitization of the economy. Um, it's, it's incredible. When I was getting grad school, Dana's reference, uh, I, I, I think I paid half of a semester's fellowship to buy a 40 megabyte Jasmine hard drive. And that had everything I'd ever created on it. And if I asked how many gigs are in the average person's, bo on average person's body right now in the pockets, it's probably in the gigs and, and beyond. So it's pretty impressive from the point of view of the Eric, the grad student at Stanford looking, looking to the future where we are now. And the algorithms we have, some are older and are, are now being shown to be more effective with the data fueling them. And there are some new pieces of work going on, uh, all leading to this, uh, this inflection point, as I call it here. Uh, for me, another way to view where we are right now in terms of recent years is this curve, which shows the, the, um, the error rate in word recognition in what's called the switchboard data set. This data set was collected by an unnamed government agency of people talking on low bandwidth telephone lines. They actually were volunteers in this case versus being surve surveilled. But, um, to, to try to transcribe this work, you see the, over the years, the error rate dropped, and then around 2000, people were hammering on this with conference papers and so on, and it, they couldn't make much progress. And then it, at Microsoft Research, with Jeff Hinton visiting us in 2009, there was this renaissance in looking at deep neural nets um, where we saw remarkable drops and discovered that these algorithms, many that had been developed in the, in the uh, late 80s and early 90s, were simply famished for data all this time. And we now could actually uh, uh, feed that hunger. And we see these slopes, and it's pretty impressive. Uh, now, this red line here is, is, is human rates of recognition, human competency. Uh, and back in 2012, we weren't there just yet. Um, but just a little while ago, in, in the fall, we achieved human parity. Uh, on that particular data set, uh, in, a, in, a, in a kind of with some fanfare, uh, this is the team that was celebrating at Microsoft Research. Um, I should say that um, th that drop um, in word error recognition rate literally enables us to go from a system that does not work to a fairly fluent translator across languages now fielded in Skype and some of the other applications we see now. So sometimes you don't know what, what it means to go down a little bit in, in error recognition rate. But I remember back in, uh, in Tianjin at, at a Microsoft uh, research presentation and a meeting in China, just a few years ago, maybe it was like four or five years ago, we demonstrated live our research prototype of real-time translation between Mandarin and English. And we all had our, like, we were sitting on pins and needles and our, had our fists clenched because we had, it just was barely working and we weren't sure if it was going to work. And a little bit further, we get some robustness now. And the same for self-driving cars and other applications right now that we see. Um, the, the work has led to other kinds of services and software, some quote unquote democratizing AI tools. So Microsoft and other companies have uh, fielded various kinds of capabilities that programmers and developers can now use in, the, in, in accord with their daily work. So Microsoft has cognitive services that you can integrate in, for example, emotion detection by calling cloud services uh, with an API call, a programmer's interface call. Um, there are things actually now in the lab that are not out just yet that will make a splash and will, of course, be commonplace to our kids and grandkids. Here's an example, recognizing human pose of a hand. 
this is not a video you're seeing. You're seeing a generative model regenerating at a distance the subtleties of fingers. And I've always said for years now that if you can get thumb and forefinger into a digital space, you can build civilizations and extend the physical world as well. And it's just really impressive to think, where will designers take this laboratory technology that's still in Microsoft Research's lab, but will be popping out into the world someday, where at a distance you can gesture and understand when engagement occurs, for example, and add this to the repertoire of human-computer interaction, this technology. Besides single wedges like vision and speech, we have technology work on building ecosystems of, 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 of assistance and, and various kinds of services that combine natural language, vision, speech, gesture, reasoning about, about physical environment and plans. This is a directions robot at Microsoft Research on every floor at Building 99. This is my assistant who has 19 years of my data, of my comings and goings. Um, that assistant knows more about whether I'll attend a meeting or not on my calendar than my human assistant from all the data by watching me over time. And she'll actually whisper to people, it's book he's booked up today, but come at 2 o'clock. I think he's going to be here, and that kind of thing. Of course, uh, we wrote, there's physical robots now, and safety's an issue. We've, we've been trying to explore what that's like in our lab. Uh, I'll get back to that in a few minutes. Now, besides some of the... Uh, technologies in the lab, there's, there are these kind of antennas or focal points. We see them at different companies. Like Google now as a personal assistant, Alexa coming out of Amazon. Microsoft has Cortana. One of the things we do uh, that's interesting, uh, and it's often I, I tell um, researchers in AI, that sometimes it's not about the deep learning. With the Skype translator, it was. But many times it's not. It's about figuring out what's the right design and even using weaker methods. Here's an example. Um, on the iPhone, I run Cortana. And I've come to rely on this really interesting feature that we created in our lab and then worked with our product team very closely called Cortana Commitments. So in the course of daily life, I look at my phone and it's pulling out promises I make to an email and showing me them and say, oops, and, and actually I can get in here and I say, say okay, okay, remind this, set a reminder by, by time or place or by seeing a person or getting a phone call to get something done. This is an example where I was at a conference at Stanford. I was at a poster, and uh, someone said, oh yeah, you mentioned that a grad student uh, at, at Cornell mentioned that, you know, you mentioned this dissertation from the 1968 you know, neural net paper, I read, uh, uh, thesis I read that was fabulous back in 68. And I answered, I said, well, I'll try to dig up the, I'll try to dig it up. You know, and you can really, you know, set it up like this, and you really can actually get things done. It's like, I found that 1967 paper about cycle times and random neural networks, and everyone's so happy that my commitment has been addressed. And I get like 10 of these per day or so, so people don't tell me, like, on Thursday, where are those slides you promised me? My, uh, this is, again, a design issue. It's a lot about, it's a lot about design and human-computer interaction, less about the actual inference about th th how... Well, you can do, although I have to say that deep learning allows us to do this better now with better curves, better lower false positive rates, and so on. So there's lots of uh, opportunity to harness these technologies. I, I want to start this way because I want to really start on a, on a strong note. Like I'm, I feel very strongly that AI and technologies coming out of this realm, this crest of computer science now on, in, the, in the science of the intellect, which is kind of a, a new direction for humanity, is we can really harness this technology to assist, empower, and protect people. Um, so Saqib uh, is a, is a sight-impaired Microsoft developer based in London, and he took, working with a small group, Meg Mitchell and others, he took off the shelf now AI technologies, the cognitive services, and he designed a system uh, uh, working as a, in a team, a small team, uh, kind of an ad hoc group that addressed the challenge he had as a sight-impaired, or he has, as impaired person, which is when he talks in a group meeting, he doesn't know about attention. You know, this is a pivot head glasses, and he hears audio signals about what's going on in front of him. Uh, we have a, a little video you can watch on the web about this, but actually hearing that there's a happy person attending, a surprised male, the ages, through the cognitive services, you can imagine where you might take this per societal benefit in sort of supporting people, teams, and organizations. <laughs> Wow, that's loud. So, so AI could also help us with human-powered things that we just don't know how to do very well, like fly drones. How many people have tried to fly a drone in the room here successfully? Anybody try to play with a drone? 
even at a, even at, even at, even at a ski resort, right? You, it's, it's like human-powered danger here. And uh, again, human fearing human. I think this might be his own device. Um, it's not all about AI, it's about people sometimes. This guy looks like he's in really good shape until he runs out of power. <laughs> so, so at Microsoft Research, uh, we, we fielded something, a technology or a, a package called AirSim that was, was trending at number two on GitHub. I think it was ahead of TensorFlow for quite a while. Um, imagine a rich simulator. You could take your, your actual drone code, the actual same CPU, inject it into this space and do machine learning on thousands of runs and trials with actual sensor values coming off that simulated world that match realistically the sensor values you'd see if you flew your drone uh, in the natural environment. Air pressure, wind, uh, lighting, um, it really try to layer in physicality in a way that we can actually learn to build systems that are more robust, more safe, understand people for semi-autonomous and autonomous uses. AI is also getting into safety critical areas like healthcare. Um, this is a really a, a, a fabulous a demonstration of what's possible. I, I'm on the advisory board at John computer science department, so I like to boast about the department, part of my job, I guess. But this is work from several years back that shows uh, work on machine vision and planning algorithms and with learning, of course. So these hidden Markov, mo uh, hidden Markov models were being used here uh, to recognize the grammar of surgery. What are some repetitive kind of recognizable intentions goals in, that surgeons will be doing, positioning, inserting, a left transfer, tightening a suture. And once you learn that, you can have a system someday, and this was a, last year in science translational medicine, this was a collaboration between Johns Hopkins and the folks at Children's Hospital in Washington, D.C., that chose a robotic system working hand, literally hand in hand with a human surgeon, coordinating. It's a mix of initiatives on doing what's called an anastomosis repair, one of the more complicated surgical maneuvers. But I think it's very interesting to watch this, to imagine where this is going, if you can have fluid someday uh, interaction between machine and human in a way that there's complementarity explicit in what's going on in terms of the task. Um, and uh, you see the infrared camera is recognizing the actual seam in the actual flesh there. It's very interesting how that might work someday. And just talking about making America safe again or safer, right? Uh, so three reports suggest that there are nearly a thousand people a day who are dying in the United States because of preventable medical error in hospitals. There's been uh, Institute of Medicine studies, uh, other kinds of studies that define what it means to a preventable uh, error and a death that could be avoided. But the late, latest paper, about a quarter of a million people per year. It's the third most common cause of death in the United States behind cancer and heart disease. So one project direction in our team and related teams, our colleagues, is how can we use AI to build safety nets someday in the way, like we have, you don't know, expect problems, but just in case the bridge worker hips and falls off that girder, we can catch them. Uh, and one model, kind of model here, we call a surprise modeling, where we take data that really captures a surprise, that's something that surprised an expert, let's say an emergency room doctor, and we do machine learning on surprises, and I could, we can read more about this, so I can tell more, more in detail in the Q&A, in a way that at, let's say, discharge time for a patient, the system tells the doctor, this case might surprise you, with what's really going on here. Do you want to see what I'm thinking? Based on a massive compendium of surprises, even if rare, over many years. And we all know about automobile uh, safety challenges. I lost my mother to an automobile accident in 1987 when she was 57. Uh, we had a big chunk, a, a whole family, my in-laws were killed when a, their camper was hit by a truck that went out of control a few years ago. Um, but it's not just, it, not just personal, but there's a death every 25 seconds in the world based on a car accident. There are about 100 US deaths per day and many more thousands of lifelong, when I think about this, lifelong disabling injuries that change someone's life forever, in terms of, like, for example, head injuries. So automation in transportation can go a long way. Even the consortium that came up with agreements to someday field soon, 
braking systems that are very smart about with low false positive rates um, to preventing deaths. This is the dashboard of a Tesla. Um, I happen to own one. I couldn't avoid resist buying one as an AI person, as as, as pricey as it might be <laughs> to just try these th out, out the Tesla, including the self-driving features. On self-driving, the Tesla has a model, and many of our systems, uh, and it's kind of a best practice, I think, to build c models of confidence to systems that can reflect about, in a context-sensitive way, how well are they doing now? And the Tesla might be taking over your automatic steering and your braking, and you can sort of hang back and kind of just barely touch the wheel and maybe hopefully attend to what's going on. But it'll scream at you when its confidence drops and in maybe too quick of a way and in a, in a rough way, just pass the baton to the human being and say, take over, I can't go on with a loud alarm. Now think about the challenge of bringing complex, safety-critical AI systems into the open world. It's, my, it's, one of, it's a passion of mine, something I'm interested in, both the scientific issues and what it means for the aspirations in the field of AI. You know, people seem to do pretty well in the open world most of the time. Our systems are very brittle, typically. Think about a car, uh, an automatic uh, autonomous vehicle or semi-autonomous vehicle design studio, an engineering studio. Just thinking about what might come the way of the car that was not thought about in the first pass, right? It's like, what's going on here? What have we not considered yet? What might the car do in these edge conditions? How long do we have to observe cars that are fielded in the open world to get some of these cases intact? This is one that I faced one night on the road. In the distance, I saw a lane being closed slowly, and I said, I'm not so sure if my Tesla knows about that while I was in an automated mode talking to a, a hockey player buddy late at night. I just put, grabbed the wheel and watched and I was so uncertain that it wasn't going to hit. I just had to grab, I, just, I took over and I said, I don't know if the system knows about cones yet. Here's another one I, I just faced recently on the way to a, a retreat at Microsoft up, a, up, at, a, up at a snowy pass. Um, I said, I'm not so sure that the Tesla designers know about the rear ends of these deer. And so I, so I took over and I grabbed the wheel at that point in time and I had some giggly passengers along with me. I don't know about that either. Uh, um, but again, open world, is, there are rising concerns about AI in the open world. You can, I just give you a, a flavor for why, um, especially in safety critical areas. So in particular, there's a, there's a, a growing technical area of what it, does it mean for the science of creating robust, trustworthy systems that can do well and that can, can I fail safe or fail soft? What does it mean for the design? There's a whole history in engineering of, of fail-safe systems like air brakes we need to study and understand how they'd apply more to the current digital world we're in with these smart systems. Again, um, th 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 these kinds of failures have been in the news lately, but they should be expected. This was um, a, a few weekends ago when Uber suspended its test of the self-driving vehicles, I think in, in, uh, in Tempe, Arizona. Um, they claimed, well, you know, we had some unexpected human behavior in front of us. Well, isn't that part of the world? That's part of the open world, the humans, what the humans might do on the road. And all Tesla t owners will tell you stories about strange things that have happened where the car had no idea about the social experience of what it means to be driving with other drivers on the road and what they assume about your car, what it'll do in different settings, like a yield setting and so on, when the people usually expect a human being to slow down, the car won't. It just keeps on going, going through, for example. Um, the other interesting thing that comes up is, is the ethics of these automated systems. And this has been in the news, people talk about this, but there's a really clear, important, and challenging notion in engineering right now. And the way I, the way I like, like, like to frame this is, w is when an injury or death is likely, and a split second that w goes way big faster than a human being's reflection needs to be made about which way to go, for example, and which injury to sustain, uh, or which death, there's, an, there's a really interesting issue about the fact that we can now represent the ethics, the utility functions inside our modules, our systems. I often say that you can go back and look at machines of the past, the 1968 Chevrolet Impala. There's a utility function in there. It, there's trade-offs made in the design. But now, today, especially with more uh, increasing abilities in automation, coupled with the fact that we can represent a trade, it might mean we want to think more deeply about how we do the ethics, as well as who buys off on the ethics. So imagine someday there's a best practice that says, yes, you've just bought your self-driving car, but 
you can't use it until you review these videos, show us you understand the trade-offs, and pick them yourself. Do you want to lower the probability of a death of an animal at the cost of, and with, with probabilities from data, of injuring someone in the car? Or do you want to just take the animal out and keep the car safe? Well, maybe you want to move that slider yourself. But once you do, what does that mean about your ownership of the utility function and implications for the precedent going forward with law and liability? Here's another concern that's coming up uh, that, it, that, I, that keeps me up at night sometimes uh, when I'm thinking about it, at night. Uh, we put new AI modules into our systems and part of the flow of our larger machinery, including safety critical systems, we're creating new AI attack surfaces. And we thought cybersecurity was bad with the old attack surfaces. So here's an example um, that I think we should think about. It's a, it's a very illustrative example. It's pretty recent. Uh, Papineau et al. Here's a neural net that takes inputs on the left, and it, after it does its thing with training to get the weights right, it outputs probabilities of what it's seeing. And it's, it's a vision system in this case. Well, there's something, there's an area called adversarial machine learning. Some of you may be studying at the Data and Society uh, organization. Um, that says, if I have access to the system, I can start doing some funny things that might be quite challenging and even dangerous and concerning. As an example, let's say I have a system that a car is using to see, to see traffic signs automatically in traffic lights, like a stop sign. I can work with this with a, with, with, with a, a quick observation and learning in the loop to change this sign bit by bit, and as part of my optimization function, say that I want to make my changes fairly undetectable or non-detectable by a human being. So I'm going to change that stop sign. See, you see the difference there? Well, to us, to our human perceptual systems, that's the same stop sign. But when I put this stop sign in front of the neural net, it sees a yield sign now. This is called adversarial machine learning, bit by bit changing the, the, the way a system will respond in a way that human beings, in this case, can't understand directly. It's not just that example. This group showed how you can change all sorts of signs on, on, during, a, during a day on the road. And, and we have to consider our minds as attackable as well. And this is getting to a topic I know that's, I wouldn't say near and dear, but near to the hearts <laughs> and minds of people in, in the data, data and society. Um, to me, it's very concerning uh, the topic here. Here's a recent study that the Twitter firehose, the, the data available for research to researchers of uh, a large corpus of data from Twitter that looked at the ability to build a neural network that could literally write out this text targeted at a single human being. So imagine AI systems that have access to uh, the tweets and the responses of hundreds of millions of people over time, but that can take that data and look at what you do and tirelessly figure out how to make you click on a phishing link tirelessly, working just in your mind. There's no, this doesn't sound very costly. This would be a full-time job for the computer, and you wouldn't even know, you know, as, 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 and for everybody else getting attacked. But in this case, the neural net wrote the actual text out, and they showed the boost they can get by doing things like the data is not just the tweets, but the system is watching what topic you tweet about when you're responding what events you're attending, and where are you now as part of its inferences. Of course, a lot, going, a lot more going on in this space and uh, many topics being studied, studied here. We talked about some this morning in meetings here or earlier today. Um, this is a, a concerning uh, video of work that was that was presented shortly. That was This video was made before Donald Trump was our president. Um, uh, but what hap was happening here is we're showing how uh, image-based rendering and machine vision can be used to put and control in a fluid manner you can't tell expressions and even language on someone else's face. It's pretty impressive. Um, I guess this would be heresy today, but in the fall it wasn't, to just pick another random political person and uh, talk a little bit about how you could control someday um, even a live stream by changing emotions. And I have several several uh, uh, colleagues in AI that believe within a few years that political figures will be, you'll be able to create them with such fidelity 
you would never know it wasn't the real person saying something, let's say, in a time of crisis, for example. And of course, the, the machine bias uh, question, which has come to the fore over the last few years, is, is a very, very important issue. I was just talking to Dana this morning how it's kind of interesting how for years, we've been working with machine learning and trying to get systems to work, and when they work, they typically work better than people can do, and we're so excited about them. And we never really thought deeply until more recently that, wow, these systems, given the data sets, can be interesting, have interesting biases in them that can amplify the biases in our society, um, gender, uh, skin color, and so on. And of course, the, the, the nice ProPublica piece came out last year talking about bias in criminal justice systems. You know, there's, there's lots of interest uh, in, in, in state and federal government um, in the U.S. at systems that could help judges understand when they can release someone charged with a crime in advance of their court date. It, there's, there's great evidence that it's a great thing to do for the, for the, for the lives, the future lives of these people, keep them going with their job and so on and their families. Um, but it's hard to know whether they'll commit a, a, a violent crime in the meantime or, or jump the, their, their, their away and not, not show up for their court date. And data has been used to sort of advise judges. In fact, we've heard great stories that whole, uh, prisons in Florida were, were closed with this, this kind of inference going on because so many people were being let out now that systems said they could be let out. So there's a really nice side to this story that we don't often think about. But still, the notion that um, specific people are being targeted in ways that might be biased you know, raises the hair in the back of your neck. Is this possible we're doing this as, as AI people seeking a better world? And how might we address the issue here? It's not just those kinds of systems. So I mentioned before that we have cognitive services at Microsoft, emotion, age, gender, um, oppose, other kinds of detection going on, language translation. Uh, one of the systems actually we, we have that's available is this idea of detecting emotion. So anger, contempt, disgust, fear being computed in from a picture, for example. Well, Anna Howard, a researcher at Howard Univer at, at, sorry, uh, at uh, Georgia Tech University, was visiting us last summer, and together we worked on, a, on sort of a maybe a less controversial topic than race, age. And we, we noticed that the Microsoft fielded Microsoft Cognitive Service for Emotion sort of performed in strange and poor ways at times for children, young people. And if you looked at the way it was trained, and, and the sort of the distribution of images was trained on more towards the adult. And so it was messing up uh, between two kinds of emotions in children. And we showed how by understanding that and testing it, a methodology for what I would call adding a machine learning contact lens, like for the Hubble telescope, that would sort of convert the existing big system and make it available and accurate for children. You can imagine best practices in this field. How do you test these systems across across different constituencies, for example. And although the focus of attention today is on training data to algorithms to predictions and what's happening there, and of course, th what goes on typically is you have a training set and you have a holdout set you test with to see how well a system would do on the next data you would see if you hadn't seen it yet, um, building what's called the receiver operator characteristic curve and people try to you know, minimize the false positive rates and maximize the true positive rates and they calculate the area under this curve as a measure of how well the classifier might do in, in a whole range of different uses. But in reality, it's a pipeline that goes also to decisions and to usages. We also have to consider what, when you build a filter, what personal data is used live when it makes its inferences and notions about the logic of this whole cycle here, including um, you know, what, who, when, and what's the accuracy of the training data, how representative is it, the algorithm, um, the data being used, the validation of predictions in a specific context that might not be the same as the training context, the decision policy, what thresholds are being used, for example, and is it intended for a fully automated system or for guidance and recommendations to a to, to human being? Very different use cases. And this is a really interesting issue. So when I read the ProPublica piece last year, you know, I, I, I almost said I don't really understand the details of the analysis of skin color and race and proxies that were used and what the outcomes are. But I want to look, and I made a note, I want to look into this more in, in more detail. But I noted some severe problems with best practices that I knew from the get-go were like, you know, were, were, were showstoppers. One was that 
the training data from one city was being used in another city. That's not a good idea. Um, training data from one point in time was being used at another point in time without validation of whether that was representative of the new case. So what do you do about, this is often an assumption that the model that was trained can be used in many different places. Now, years ago, in 2005, 2006, we built a system called Readmissions Manager. That would take, we worked with one hospital in Washington, D.C. It took 30,000 variables, 20 years of data. Wow, we're going to predict at discharge time which patients are going to bounce back to the hospital within 30 days. A, a, actually, a, a penalized outcome for hospitals and tracked very closely. And the, the system performed quite well that we built. And this system is being used around the world now. But we tried the first version of our system. We said, oh, it's great. Here we're ready to go. We tried it on a hospital 10 miles away. Like, Oops, that's interesting. The accuracy fell dramatically. Another hospital, different kinds of demographics, different kinds of distribution of people, ages, for example, are different and so on. So we realized we had to use local data to make this work and built a cycle in this system that trained and tested locally and sent out those curves you saw at every single hospital. Now, sometimes, unfortunately, you don't have as much data as you might want. And so you, there is a, a growing area of science called transfer learning for how do you effectively take data grab from one location and morph it and get the squeeze it for the best you can do from that location for a different location. Transfer learning. And if you want, we have a, a paper written about this uh, transfer learning among those same hospitals I mentioned earlier uh, for, the, for the, the challenge of predicting whether a patient will become infected in the hospital with a, an infection called C. difficile. But it's challenging work and it's a, but it's a nice direction to go in. But you simply can't just look the other way and uh, apply these systems around the world, whether it be for, for criminal justice or other high stakes areas. In the labor front, uh, you know, AI and workforce has been in the news lately. If you ask people what they're worried about, the public, you might hear uh, Terminator scenarios, which we can talk about maybe in Q&A, maybe a little bit here right, right now, and job loss, job replacement loss. It's, it's, it's certain that there will be disruptions ahead uh, with human labor being augmented or replaced by AI systems, by systems that understand that master of what we consider so human, the, our, our intellect in various ways, as well as physical, the physicality and robotics. Um, it's also certain that AI will create tremendous wealth. So the question is, you take these two kind of lines here, how can these treasures be shared? I think that's the big challenge we're going to see in our lifetimes, uh, and in policy fronts, and government, and economic systems. Um, on April 14th, um, a committee that I served on at the National Academy of Science, it we went two years, I, I found it fascinating, for the people that I met, like uh, Ruth Milkman from, from CUNY here, who, is, who studied um, you know, the, the science, or the, uh, you know, demographics and science and ethnography of what happens when you introduce robotics into assembly lines. Turns out, it's not one thing, depending on where you are, for example was on this, on this committee with us. But we, we fielded this report. I'll just show you a couple of uh, figures from the report that I think are interesting. And some of you have seen these kinds of figures before. This was co-chaired by Tom Mitchell and Eric Bielsen. But one troubling figure is going from 1950 to 2010 here and showing the, the um, median family income pulling away from the real GDP per capita. So if you divide all the wealth up by person, Look at what, what, that, what that would mean, and look at what these families are actually you know, uh, acquiring. There's a growing gap, which means the wealth is not being distributed. It's a pretty clear image. Right? Here's an image that I showed at a college campus recently when I gave a talk uh, on the 100-year study. Um, that's why I put college up here, high school, college, and grad school, and I asked people wh whether they're going to go to grad school or not. This is 1963 to 2008. Here, the red line shows 1963 corrected normalized wages for full-time, full-year male workers. And you see, back in the 1960s, whether you went to high school, red, college, gold, grad school, you know, you sort of were on this curve of upward uh, growth in your, in your income. But towards the, the mid-80s eight to late eight, uh, nine, 80s into early 90s, there was a crash of people with high school, high school dropouts, uh, a slowing of the college and, in, and a speed up 
acceleration in in, in the in the 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 salaries required by grad people that finish grad school. Now look at this picture. This is almost like an image test. Look carefully at this picture. See where the high school is. See where college is and grad school. I was looking at this graphic as editing this document with Tom and Eric and others on the committee and with Milkman when this graphic appeared in the New York Times on November 9th, 2016, a few days after the election of Donald Trump, that said, areas with many white voters without a college degree form the core of Mr. Trump's support. And if you look at the where they're showing is without a college degree, map it to the Trump support, you say, hmm, I wonder if there's an economic link here. It almost really shows in the data. So is automation of various kinds and the growth of the science of the intellect affecting you know, the sentiment and uh, people's aspirations in political figures and what political figures might say someday where they have said in responding to this. So what are some AI futures and what do we do? I mean, certainly organizations like Data and Society are so critical to be on top of things and be out ahead and thinking about issues that people, the rest of the, the world and country, most people haven't even thought about yet, but they're here with us now and they're showing up in, these, in reports like this and in, in subtle signals and some more salient signals. Um, back in, um, uh, in 1899, uh, Jean-Marc Cote, uh, kind of a futurist and also kind of an advertising person, I think he was a marketing person, was trying to conceive of the future en l'an 2000. What would life be like in 2000? And you see the metaphors that he was stuck on. Electricity, that's where it's going. This is the future of, uh, of education. Somehow we grind up knowledge and distribute it through electrical headsets. Uh, home automation, this is, uh, you know, probably make Rodney Brooks excited with the, with the, uh, with the with home vacuuming and so on. And there's a whole set of these, agriculture and industry. Look at this one here. This is uh, the future of warfare. This is 1899, well before the Wright brothers built a plane which looks quite different than today's planes showing a concern about would there be airships someday and would they harm people from the air. Now imagine if this was thought about very deeply and there was an international convention. You don't drop dangerous stuff from the air. We agree as humanity. Um, this almost looks like a modern picture if you squint a little bit. Now back to the airplane metaphor. I believe that today we kind of just Machine intelligence, we just kind of got off the sandy beach. We timed it, we have a black and white camera in several different areas of AI, and we're talking about it. Saying, wow, this is really interesting. Where is this going? Now, it's unclear how fast things are going to go or where they're going to go. However, I want you to look at the airplane metaphor for a second here. Okay. This is 1903, 50 summers after this kind of a strange contraption, flapping canvas, excitement. The US government didn't even buy this as possible, so the Wright brothers had to go to the Europe to sell their wares to military in Europe. This happened. 707, taking off on an international flight with people sitting inside that plane worrying more about their salt-free meal being ordered correctly, a, a, a flight tower with standard commands and codes, 50 summers later, a whole world changed, and it's commonplace. I want to be going to the warfare issues with planes. So in 2009, given a sense for the urgency, um, my, my, my AAAI presidency when I was, uh, this is the AAAI is the, is the Society of AI Scientists, one of the largest ones. Uh, I was president in, in, in 2008, 2009, two years. I made my presidency theme, AI in the open world, and I had three different pillars of that theme. But one was really pulling together groups to think through the societal issues and technical issues of long-term AI futures. We had committees in long-term, short-term um, disruptions and ethical and legal that met over months and then came to a Silomar to meet together and to speak and converse. I won't go into details about this, you can read about it on the, on the, on the web, but several things came out of this meeting which were to me very, very, uh, uh, thought-provoking and right on. As an example, I asked Andrew Eng on the uh, first day of the actual Silicon meeting, I said, Andrew, 
I want you to get up and I want you to give a talk on what will surprise us sooner than we think. So that, was, that was the challenge. He gave a deep learning talk. He wouldn't call it that then, but that's what he did. And that summer is when that dip occurred in that first slide, I, the early slide that I showed, a few months after this February 2009 meeting. Other things came out just like that that are now here with us now. And I thought back then, oh, by the way, I have to show you what the press said about this. This was a front page New York Times story. This is the, this is the uh, I guess we call it clickbait. Uh, that, you know, it was actually a, a good story by John Markoff, but this, I, I always complain to John when he does a story of like, who writes these titles? He goes, it's not me, <laughs> me. Um, uh, but, it, but anyway, but um, this study uh, was 2009. Five years later, I thought, let's do this again. There's so much, and let's get the same group or a different group together again, maybe a larger group. And then it hit me, we should actually do this every five years, forever, given that we're going to be tracking a very, very important science here. It's probably going to be making waves and changing the way we work and live um, in salient and in strange, subtle ways and powerful ways. And so uh, I approached John Hennessy, uh, the, who was then the Stanford president, Univers Stanford University president, and I, I posed the idea, could we endow long-term study that would continue to do reports for as long as Stanford existed? And he thought, it was a, you know, here's what he says, you know, in, in our press release here, he thought it was a fabulous idea and Stanford was the place, not other organizations. They would come and go. Stanford would be around, so it's safe. Um, uh, AI is, is one of the most profound undertakings in science and one that will affect every aspect of human life. Now, John Hennessy is a compilers guy. Well, he's also a Stanford president of the past, but compilers, but he realized that this AI phenomenon is really a promising, concerning, um, and a deep interest to, for scholarly activities and governance and policy. So the first report after a year came out in, uh, in th last September called AI and Life in 2030. What's nice about it, it includes a nice overview of what AI is from the point of view of the expert panel, how to describe it to uh, lay people, how to allay concerns about superintelligence and runaway AI that's in the press, uh, and how to underscore several important issues. Two, two, uh, I'll just mention two points that came out of that study. One, I want to stress, the need to engage. And of course, this is not news to data and society folks, right? You know, emerging technologies have the potential to profoundly transform society and the economy for the better by 2030, but near-term design and policy decisions are likely to have long-lasting effects, maybe even lock-in. The other one is need to engage. We need to balance technical innovations with mechanisms that ensure that AI's economic and social benefits are broadly shared. And the call was for AI researchers, social scientists, policymakers, work together. It's really important to bring people together. Now, we could do other kinds of studies over time. I'll tell you about one uh, interesting, fun one that we just completed in February that we're now writing up. Um, so um, I co-chaired a meeting called Envisioning and Addressing Adverse AI Outcomes. And the homework assignment to a very diverse group, including core computer scientists, um, uh, people that study policy, people in government, um, cybersecurity experts, including the winners of the Cybersecurity Challenge, or top players, the director of DARPA, the DARPA Cybersecurity Challenge Program, um, uh, came together. The homework assignment was, think of one or more adverse AI outcomes, work hard on this, think about the trajectory of how it happened, document the, the, the steps along that trajectory, make sure you look at the form we gave, you know, is it long-term, short-term, is it chronic, insidious, salient, we have a nice set of attributes, get crisp. And we said, make it battle-hardened because we're going to have a blue team that's going to pull it apart and a red team that's going to go hard against the blue team. And so we ended up with six basic scenarios. I'm not going to talk about them today. Um, with a red team and a blue team, here's Kathleen Fisher who chaired the cybersecurity, AI and cybersecurity session um, um, with the, the, the in intense red team, including a, 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 a lead government person and uh, a, a Cracker Jack blue team, including, including verification people, cybersecurity people, going at it. This is one of the more concerning ones that we kind of didn't solve, and people left the meeting thinking, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. But it's good to go there, to continue to do this kind of red team, blue team. Can we really frame important research on the horizon? 
it's much more important than sitting on our hands and worrying about Terminator coming. I think to really get active and don't worry, get to work. Right? Find these scenarios, get crisp about them, and if they're true, let's, let's address them now. By the way, uh, here's how the press described this event. Just so you <laughs> <laughs> actually, D Dina Bass did a great story. So if you read the story, it's actually, again, I'm not sure who does the headlines, but it's a, it's a very well-written piece. So finally, I want to talk about a little bit about the um, AI partnership. We, um, this is a new effort over the last year and a half or so that we had a meeting uh, with earlier with the, the data, interested data and society folks. I'm really excited about it. This uh, um, nonprofit partnership was founded by six companies. Actually, I should say they're researchers who dragged the companies into this, but willingly. Um, the idea is to, is to uh, be balanced, to bring in different sectors, be multi-party, um, uh, bring in stakeholders in, in, in civil liberties, in privacy, in open AI research, scientific researchers, to balance, have a balanced board of the for-profit and non-profit. We have a set of tenants, I'll just show you two. We are committed to open research and dialogue on the ethical, social, economic, and legal implications of AI. We seek to develop AI research and technology that is robust, reliable, trustworthy, and that operates within secure constraints. There's a, you can go to the partnership on AI.org website and read the full set of tenants that all the companies have agreed upon to promote and to help with, as well as the larger board of trustees right now. Um, also on the website, we publish seven thematic areas. Um, of, of effort, um, it's, still, it's still at the formative stages now, as we're defining what we'll be doing in safety critical AI. I said we, I'm the currently founding co-chair, working with Mustafa Seliman at DeepMind. Uh, safety critical AI, fair, transparent, and accountable AI, collaborations between people and AI systems, um, say AI and the, and the workforce, um, deeper social and societal influences, like deeper economic influences, political, um, mind swaying and so on, influences of AI, AI and social good and special initiatives. So we're, I'm very hopeful that this group will catalyze efforts um, and will, will, will add its voice to staying vigilant, being proactive, seeking out best practices uh, in, in various applications and uses and even in the research on machine intelligence. So let me stop there and take some questions. I hope you enjoyed my little survey. And uh, to I was just sharing what I'm very excited about, uh, both on the, on the good and the promising side, as well as some of the, the rough edges and concerns coming our way. Thanks very much. Eric can go in a bit different direction. Where do folks want to take it? Where are the questions? Hi, thanks. That was, that was very interesting. Um, question about um, acceptable levels of th thresholds of, of risk. So different areas of public safety, if in aviation or auto, we yeah. e either institutionally or we kind of understand to be certain acceptable limits for safety. Um, thinking about different, I hate to use the word because it's not really a use case, but different applications of AI. For instance, in the, the cognitive stuff that you showed from Microsoft, uh, I was at a talk a few days ago and they, they showed the video of the vision impaired person, it, it was great. I kept thinking like, you know, there's not really like a, a high cost to, to, either, to either error type here, but there certainly could be in other applications. And it's, I'm, I'm envisioning this kind of like FDA label of ingredients, right, that says, you know, here's the testing that we did and here's what we have deemed accessible given these contexts of use, et cetera. Have you thought about that or is it the kind of thing that others are thinking about or yeah, not I yet, just keep the data under the, the table and have people use the applications? No, ab absolutely, and, and this is one of the, 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 the the folks I have attention in this organization here. Um, we had a chance to talk a little bit earlier today with a group about what are some possible best practices around each of the pillars, including safety critical systems, for example. Certainly our thresholds. Systems should, you would think, uh, be able to report their confidence in a situation in a well-calibrated way, and that should be documented how well that works. Uh, the performance should be documented. Um, notions of risk and trades should be understood. Uh, where the data came from to train the system. You can imagine a set of important issues, but you're right about the other suggestion you made, which is other industries have grappled with risk for a long time. In the aviation, we've had FAMIA and FAMICA analyses, which is a methodology for actually computing a probability of failure. Sometimes it's a little bit wacky. Remember the 
the Challenger disaster and the one in the rubber seals, is the one in whatever thousands, tens of thousands, and where did that number come from? But there actually are some reasonable approaches to doing this, and you can imagine uh, characterizing um, these systems. You also might imagine a best practice in how you feel the safety critical system. The FDA requires a set of phased trials, phase one clinical trial. Was there a phase one clinical trial for the Tesla automated features? And in this case, it's not just the patient who's taking the medication. This is a, this is a, a social experience. The car's on the road involving other people. Might a best practice be there's a certain time or period of testing of a limited number of, of, of drivers and then a reporting methodology like the FDA would have, like how I feel, what happened, and where I, there's a back channel. Some strange things happen with the Tesla. I'd love to tell somebody, push a button and say, hey guys, look at the, look at the logs, I mean, and, give, and annotate it while I'm driving. Um, but you can't, there's no back channel, and Tesla's learning by fleet learning, they, they say. They're looking at all the data and trying to make things better, and things are getting better over time. Might, during the phase one clinical trial, automated cars, when they're in automated mode, have a bright strobe light that tells the other cars, hey, there's a clinical trial, <laughs> trial phase one automated car right now, and it's in automated mode. I'm gonna go in the other lane, maybe. Or I'm gonna yield differently when I see that coming at me when I'm getting onto the highway. You can imagine best practices that take some of these nuanced ideas that I just described very qualitatively and make them hard and fast and even, you even have documentation and a label that says certified in this way in a, per a standard or a norm. Yeah, thanks. Oh, there you are. The Ethics and Governance of AI Fund. I have a question on explainability. Um, a lot of the nascent sort of policy regulation around the space asks the company or government to explain the logic behind the automated decision making. Do you feel, and I've asked a lot of people about this, people um, give me very contradictory answers as to whether there is a trade-off between explainability and accuracy. What is the way? Do you, if there is a trade-off, do we need to, in certain settings, look at you know, particular types of mechanisms like decision trees which are more explainable, or if you're talking about neural nets or others, could you run an algorithm against those other algorithms where one algorithm's job is to be the explainability algorithm? How does it work? It strikes me that interpretability, explainability is a really important area in certain settings going forward, criminal justice being one of them, education, employment, et cetera. What's your thinking? I thought it's a, it's a really good, good question. I have to say that um, one comment I make, I've made recently in front of the AAAI audience is that explanation and understandability were actually central ideas in the 1980s in the expert systems world. Whole dissertations were written on how do you explain the trace and the inference to the doctor. That fell by the wayside. And now even for explainable machine learning is like, what is it? A weighted function, a weighted function of terms? Do you call that the explainable model? Who's that explaining, who, who is that explaining anything to? Forget the deep neural net, I can, I can understand the, 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 the logistic regression with the set of terms. Is that really an explanation? Do you buy that? Or are you caught up in the, what people are calling transparency? But let's just start there. Let's say that a, 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 a learning algorithm that has a set of terms with weights on them, and we like to say for a doctor, you see symptom A, B, C, D, E, there's pluses and minuses and Ks of weights in front of each one, and that's the explanation. That's, by the way, that's the gold standard today for explainable machine learning. And as we hear, as we heard, and is correct, some of those models don't perform as well as the models that you can't separate out into these, into these linear, mo linear functions. Now, if we just buy for a second that, that the first models are explainable, which I don't, by the way, and I think we, we have a lot of work to do in explaining not just the inference, but also the whole pipeline to people, including thresholds and so on, and training sets and representation representativeness of the data. Um, it turns out that great research is going on, back to your question exactly, at having your cake and eating it too. And you pose one solution, like, oh, why don't we just reason with this deep system and it's black box, we can't figure it out, but we'll have an explanation module that tries to guess a little bit and does more poorly, but it can explain most of what the, the black box is doing, even if it's not the same mechanisms, and that'll be a good explanation. I don't know if that's a good explanation, a good, 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 good solution either, but there are some pieces of work. You should look at Rich Caruana's re recent work using general, uh, generalized additive models that are basically showing how you can put, instead of those Ks, you can put functions in front of those terms and get almost all the power out with a linear kind of model if you buy that that's an explanation. And I'll stop there. It's get, this is actually a real issue because GDPR, which is a, a set of, 
of requests and um, from the European uh, uh, consortium is coming in a year, and there are statements along the lines of, you know, uh, when end users are affected by a decision or recommendation or automation, that they need to have a meaningful understanding of its basis. They have a right to a meaningful explanation. So companies right now are, are thinking, like Microsoft and Google and others, hey, what do we do about this by March, whatever it is, Mar uh, by 2018, the, the month when it's going to go live? And I believe that what needs to be done is a conversation with these committees in Europe and a negotiation and research coupling, coupled with that about what really would make up the kind of meaningfulness they want in understandability or non-understandability of a system. Hi, oh. Eric. Um, I can't see. Oh, I've got wave, the right yeah. of the microphone. <laughs> um, uh, Julia Powers, I'm at Cornell hey. Tech. Um, oh, oh, and, and speaking of whom, <laughs> I mean, you, your former life. Yeah. Um, so I, I just wanted to pick up your en passant reference to lock-in. And, um, yes. and particularly the, the founding members of the partnership and their kind of general influence in the AI debate. Um, I w my question by, by, the, by the way, debate means discussion in the UK, so you just know <laughs> that. Um, my question is whether you think <laughs> that there is um, sufficient research going on that isn't, as, is that a sufficient remove from any of those companies? My, it, it comes from, I've been looking at DeepMind in the last year, and I can't find any research lab working on AI that doesn't have some people employed by DeepMind or another of these six companies. I see. So it's an interesting question about, we, we often think about truly multi-party, multiple voices, is this a corporate cabal? Even if it isn't, what mechanisms are in place to assure that it's not over time when you have this kind of dominance in, let's say, machine learning area right now, because it's such a competitive uh, terrain for, for commerce and revenue, you can imagine that these companies are paying top dollar for the best people, and therefore, there's a kind of this, this pressure that they go to the to the, the to industry right now, which is a which is a concern for academia in some ways. Um, so uh, I'd say yes is the answer. Um, but let's say it was no. Um, what might the partnership do to address this potential general genuine concern? And that's a question on the on the table for the board of trustees and for the steering committee and executive directors, the office of the executive director now, or the future executive director of the partnership on AI, um, that, that we just need to address. So it's a good question um, in, in, in having true representation um, and to assure uh, that it's not just companies that have a voice. It, it is a balanced board right now, with six and six, with, with strength in um, multiple sectors and expertise coming into sector steering committees and working groups. So uh, we hope it will not be by design dominated by the companies or their, or their pressure. Um, uh, we, we, we spoke a little bit earlier about concerns of various kinds with being on the inside of the partnership on AI for making sure this goes well. Um, it's helpful, it's valuable to society. Uh, all the all the tenets we really really believe in strongly, um, and one of the issues is 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 the realities and the perception of the corporate influence, and we have to just we just have to get that right, and maybe we should have a private conversation about ways to do that. Hi, Eric. Uh, is this on? Uh, in 2016, you gave a similar talk to Senate. Uh, have you seen <laughs> evidence that government is prepared and capable of addressing these concerns that you brought out? Uh, I would not call my talk to Senate anything any, any way similar to this talk. Uh, I basically sa I sat there with a prepared statement and I, I read off some statistics and I was very, you know, I, had, I think I had like something like a minute, 30 seconds to, or whatever it was, like five minutes. And it was um, very, I tried to be very simple and clear. Um, I did get a question from one of the senators. This is all in the congressional record now. I don't know which one, so pardon my invitation. I was like, what about that Terminator scenario? So I had, okay, well, I better address that. And then I came up with some comments about how I feel and, you know, the balanced approach to it and so on. And, and um, don't want to just dismiss concerns outright, but we want to study them. And, uh, and, and that led to, actually, that particular interaction in public led to some government people coming 
to the uh, that red blue team study and that we're very engaged with it. Um, what do we think about government? So, so there's interesting questions, for example, about whether and when governments should get involved in regulatory activity or standards or norms about AI systems. And we were talking earlier today, again, in the, in the, in the conference we had here, that to date, most of my feeling has been, when it comes to regulatory activity, I see most profitable and appropriate activity in sectors like transportation, like have the experts, like for the US, the National Highway Transportation Association or the Department of Transportation be working on these kinds of, of guidelines, and they are, and they've, they've said some beautiful, very appropriate things about autonomous and semi-autonomous driving. Um, there's been calls for like, you know, general offices of AI regulation. Uh, I'm, I'm not gonna name names or talk about where they, these calls come from, but to me, if you just say that like that, then someday there might be some discovery in AI that makes that make sense. Like, yes, you know, this kind of general intelligence needs to be dealt with like this and contained in this way and be careful. But today, it sounds like when you say that with today's technology, I want to regulate computer science. I want policies to keep computer science in the box, including databases. And it just doesn't seem to be well defined and given how multi uh, headed and multidisciplinary AI is. And I refer people to the AI 100 introduction about it's a nice review of, of a nice level headed, I think, summary of what AI is. And then ask the question about governance in that context. So the question is, what about culture um, or cultures? Um, what uh, hey, is ahead. AI is AI developed by US or the EU different from AI <laughs> developed by Japan? Uh, is that a it's a, it's a really huge, I mean, it's a really important question, even, even, beside, even beyond the, the subtext of the example you gave. Um, for example, it's pretty well known in the community that in Japan, and people have linked this to actual long-term myths and metaphors and symbolic symbols in society. So there's this idea in Japan, Japanese culture, I've learned, and maybe people can help me in the audience that might be wiser and deeper students of this, that ghosts are beautiful, good, supportive entities. And when you build a ghost or a ghost-like thing, like an AI agent, it's a beautiful, supportive entity. Like if I hit this table, I get supported by it. <laughs> um, and, 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 and this kind of thinking and the cultural approach to intelligence systems are building um, goes back to like how elder care systems are being viewed, the, the goodness and the intention and in building kind systems is the considered natural. In some of the Western culture, we have long-term myths about scary intelligences, Frankenstein, scary ghosts and spirits, um, the golem. Uh, and um, there's, we don't, I, I think it, we don't address enough when, I guess as Kate Crawford would say, the, the, the white guys get together and talk about their fears of the Terminator. You know, it's not gonna attack me. Uh, it, the, the, all, the, this is coming from a, with a rich cultural and deep cultural heritage we're carrying with us that tells us about what these automated automatons are like and what we should fear about them. And we need to sort of, that's just one example of cultural differences. You can imagine more. So as an example, yeah. Maybe, maybe who, who, who's ever gone to India and, and, and thought that, are you saying no or yes right now? You, you know, it's like, yes, okay, I'm, I'm learning this. Well, you know, deep learning people will tell you that deep learning can learn anything, so don't worry about it. You know, you just pour the, pour the data in and we'll see how it goes. No, but in general, I think this is a rich area for study, including if you think deeply about human-computer collaboration, um, I think design is so critical. Uh, and, you know, like, like the Cortana commitment. So just getting the design right so it really is delivering value versus being a nuisance, like a paper clip popping up in office. Um, and so um, you can imagine that cultural differences are, are, are will be quite critical. Even um, think about this, I mean, it, I've seen many cases where speech recognition systems, back to bias, don't work well for people with accents of different kinds, or even, I think many systems trained on male voices for women. Um, so there's technologies now, kind of similar to transfer learning, something called Microsoft called CRIS, 
which takes a language model or a speech model and morphs it into different contexts and different speaker, different speaker types. So you can imagine we might be able to have tools someday that let easy transfer to different cultures, but then there are these deeper issues about you know, the whole relationship with an entity and, and work and automation that might are beyond my understanding that are maybe all in our subconscious and they're very different when you go from culture to culture that might be really critical in, in how these systems are used. We had a question here that we've been... Okay. Uh, three years ago, okay. uh, IBM Watson and Sloan Kettering announced a joint venture to solve cancer, and they were going to do it in two years. Obviously, it's been three years since then. What is your opinion, both as an MD and as an AI researcher, A, to the feasibility of that project, and whether AI actually has a place in solving or curing cancer? Well, I mean, there's, there's, uh, we're, we're sitting amidst a, a, an ongoing explosion in understanding and competency about the foundations of biology with computing more broadly, but a lot of that is called bioinformatics, but if you look at the, 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 the overlapping Venn diagram, a lot of that's AI, core machine learning and inference about structure and about, about regulation, about inferring uh, regulatory pathways and so on. Uh, I was, um, I, I view, uh, speaking, uh, you know, about cancer in particular, I view biology as computational. It's largely computational. It's information theoretic. DNA is information. It's regulation, control. Um, I view cancer as, uh, in some ways, uh, you know, a, a programmatic bug or set of bugs in the, the rich programs that came to be stable that could be disrupted over time setting life back to what it, it, it has done most of the time on this planet, which is rep replicate without control. That's been the goal. Metazoan life is a recent thing about, you know, turning things off and locking, for example, into different tissues that coordinate in a symphony. So I, blew, I believe that the way to really get at cancer is through computation, and these methods will be very relevant over time. I'll refer people to one paper which, which blew my mind. Um, and it came out of a, co a collaboration of the Cambridge UK and Microsoft Research Cambridge Lab. Um, and uh, it, it's, it used an a, a, a AI theorem prover, logic theorem prover, which was developed for verification purposes, to identify a small number of inputs that, that seem to control stem cell progression to any tissue type. You, lock, you can lock it with six, I think it was six inputs, a Nature article, no, Science article like, like two years ago that was so uh, inspiring about where things are going if we really get our handle, our, our minds on the handles for controlling biology and for, for, for recognizing precancers and cancers and stopping them and stabilizing them. So that's my long answer to your question. Thank you. Um, Joe Saunders with Human Rights Watch. And I, I wanted to go to the chart where you showed, you know, sort of GDP per capita, yeah. you know, uh, a, a real GDP against, uh, you know, the median income, um, and then the Trump vote. Um, and, and in particular, the question... I, I wasn't implying causality. Was <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but, you know, this has been talked about for, for decades yes, in terms of what was inevitably going to come, which was AI, you know, basically displacing jobs. Yeah. Um, and now we seem to be at the cusp or the inflection point uh, and with the self-driving cars, and you know, that's one area where there's a lot of jobs at stake. Um, and so, when I hear the discussions, and I'm I'm, I'm an outsider to these discussions, but I'm I very think we all are, most of um, us. <laughs> but the the you know the point is usually it turns to universal basic income. Yeah. But I'm wondering what other you know that's not meaningful employment. I mean, there's a lot of studies showing that people get meaning out of employment, and even if it's inefficient, maybe, maybe artificial intelligence would do a lot better, they get a lot of meaning out of that. It's a social context as well. Um, if that's gone for increasing numbers of people, what are the measures, you know, that, that uh, you know, governments or others can be thinking about um, yeah. apart from universal basic income, which I know there's a whole discussion around that. Well, well there's two, two pillars, I'll, and this is, my, this is the last question. Okay, thank, thanks for the great questions, by the way. There are two pillars of, two pillars of thinking that come to mind with your question. One is, gets, gets at one of the uh, projects that's spinning out of the 100-year study, which is called AI Index, which is, which is now meeting to form, between the reports, there's money for projects of various kinds, and one that Yoav Shoah, Shoah started is called AI Index. And it's how do we design an index that will track the influence of AI and AI competencies over time, core competencies and against benchmarks, as well as their influence on jobs and their ability to take, take various aspects of jobs uh, on 
that people had been doing over time and influences of this activity and the services and the power on quality of life in various with various measures. Um, I think that that'll be very important. The National Academy study called for such an, indec an index and I hope to see more of that kind of work going on. Um, on what we do about the future world with economics, this is not my department. Um, I, I just think we need to be vigilant and get people on this to think it through and to be watching. Um, there are people that work on new kinds of work experiences. Um, I'm particularly interested in where uh, freelance and gig work is going to go if we have the right platforms to support it, um, especially that's complementary to machines. So I like the idea of thinking about the workplace and people and the social nature of work and persistent teams where people know each other. You don't get that on Mechanical Turk when you do a task. The idea, the prospect of doing richer things at a distance with a persistent team of folks that work in complement with machines and with each other is a promise that's possible that might be a quality life someday with even more flexibility than we have now that it relies on people for creative tasks even more than we do now. So I'll stop there, but thanks very much everybody.